Good morning and welcome to Valley Grace. We are so glad that you are here. And for those of you that are joining us on the live stream, we are so thankful that you are as well. Just one quick announcement for everyone this morning. Um, we are having another family fun day and I'm so excited about it because I loved the last one that we had. And so if you stayed, I know you had a great time because we all did. And if you didn't stay, you have another chance. So August 15th, um, we are going to have an afternoon of fun and fellowship. And so there'll be games and stuff. And there's also food is being, I mean, it doesn't say food's provided, but I'm pretty sure food is provided, um, which just makes it so for a super easy day. So plan to be there August 15th. We'll stay right after the service and we'll all just hang out and fellowship together. So if you could stand with us this morning, and I'm actually going to start us in prayer, please. So if you can stand and we'll pray first. Let's pray together. Lord, we praise you this morning that you are the one who makes a way when there is no way. The one who does what seems impossible and you always keep your promises. No matter what we think or feel, you are working and we praise you for that today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jeremiah 9, 
verses 23 through 24 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. In our culture, I think we struggle with pride. I mean, I know I do, and I'm sure many of you here can relate. But these verses remind us that there is nothing for which we can boast, only in the character of God, only in his power, ability, love, and sovereignty, and what he did for us on the cross. So let's seek him today and connect with him as we worship and praise our great God.
often I try to find the things I'm doing right for God. Maybe in ministry or my job or my family. Thinking subconsciously that maybe God's love for me is somehow greater because of the things I've done. Or on the flip side, that he turns his back on me when I'm not living the way he wants me to. But Jesus didn't die for me because I did these good things. And he didn't decide not to make that sacrifice because of my sin. In fact, Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow, what a relief. What peace that brings knowing that salvation isn't up to me, that I can stop this endless striving for perfection and that I can rest in his forgiveness when I sin. This gift from God is completely free and it's not dependent on us at all. Thank you, Jesus.
to go to Children's Church. Now the sheet that I was left says that there's a, supposed to be a special presentation. Um, if one of you is supposed to come up here and sing, would you raise your hand and, and this is your chance and this is your opportunity. Okay, Chuck? Uh, yeah. Let's all vote on that. <laughs> and, uh, uh. A little bit of what's uh, transpiring here because I had given you what we thought was our plan and that was that uh, Pam and I were not supposed to be here this weekend and so we had aligned with uh, Pastor Jim and Tina and family to come back. Um, we traded them a week in June uh, so, that, so that we could do that and they could get a little more uh, immersed up at Bethlehem PA. Um, but God had some other plans involved. Jim's still preaching, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but God had some other plans. Our plan, we were out in uh, Goshen, Indiana for a national conference and had planned on, the, on Thursday uh, to slip down July 29th to see my mother, who turned 98 on uh, July 29th. However, she, along with her caregivers, are recovering from COVID. So we didn't think that was a really good plan. Uh, so we just, we, we came on back. Actually, we stopped in Zanesville, Ohio. And uh, for the evening, because we were going to get the family together and do a Zoom call for mom on her 98th birthday, and, and that all worked. Uh, it, uh, Zanesville is a really old town. Pam and I walked around there. It's amazing, the architecture of some of the old churches there. Um, but anyway, that was kind of our stop, and then we arrived uh, back home. Um, and uh, God had a reason for us being here. And that is that uh, Dennis's stepdad, uh, Richard Brown, uh, Mr. Speedy, as he has known him, really, he raised Dennis, uh, went to be with the Lord Thursday with a sudden heart attack from what is being understood. So Dennis uh, is down there with his family trying to get some things in order. Jamie left to go down, and we get the grandkids, which is, which is a blessing. But that was, that was God's way of making sure that we were here for this particular need. Uh, we don't live a day longer or shorter than what God has for us, and so we can, we can trust in that. That great hymn, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. And so that's what we put our faith and trust in, uh, is the leading of God. Uh, Mr. Speedy and Brenda, uh, his wife, uh, both know the Lord. Dennis uh, was raised in a Christian home. We're grateful for that. Uh, Brenda has a lot of uh, physical needs as well, and so Dennis is really needing to sort through all kinds of stuff. Mr. Speedy owned his own, uh, it was called Air Repair, uh, A&P, Airframe Power Plant, uh, repairing airplanes and all of that. So there's just a lot of stuff to sort through. So we'd ask that you would be praying for uh, Dennis and his family and uh, in a result of this. Um, uh, again, we sometimes we wonder, you know, at God's plan and God's uh, calendar and and yet for those of us who walk through some of these things, we look back and we see what God did through it, sometimes this side of eternity, and sometimes not. And so we're asking that you would be praying for Dennis. I thought also it gives us a good opportunity to, to pray for some other needs within our own church family, and that is uh, that you'll be praying for Jeannie Gear. Uh, we've shared with you before, and she has asked that, that we would do this. Um, she has... Uh, 
oral surgery being done on August 12th for cancer. Um, at this point, the surgeon's telling her that they don't think it's in the bone, but even that's a long and extended uh, process. So pray for Joe and Jeannie uh, in their journey. Uh, thank you for those of you who've reached out to them. Also for the daughter of Jennifer and Alan Harrison, um, we prayed for her. She's been on the prayer list as well. Uh, she's on a list for a transplant. And a few weeks ago, I asked uh, Jenny and, and Alan uh, where she was, and she was at 29. And then last a couple weeks ago, well, she's at 20. Well, I think that's good, except for the fact that it's based on how poorly you're doing. So that's one of those, okay, Lord, we've got to put this in your hands. Do you pray for her to get worse so that she gets you know, moved up the list? We don't know. But this is, you know, the Holy Spirit, we are instructed, praise when we don't know how to pray. So we just entrust her into our Lord's care and pray for Jenny and Alan as well. An individual that most of you, well, none of you probably, well, maybe one person knows, an individual by the name of Steve and a diabetic and um, is uh, preparing to leave this earth. And so I would ask that we would, we would be praying for him uh, as well. Other prayer requests, and we will take items of praise if you have some that uh, you would like to share uh, just as a church family. Anybody? Yeah, Kendra. All right, Kendra's asking that we would pray for a friend of family, 15-year-old, um, who's just wrestling with some suicidal thoughts. And we find a lot of that going on in our day and that might find hope and encouragement. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for uh, your work and the fact that you lead us through life and uh, that we can trust you. And as we've had a chance, uh, some have had an opportunity to walk with you for many years, and Lord, we've always seen you faithful. There have been times of great joy and times of great sorrow. And so, Lord, thank you that you do lead us, that we can trust you, that you are sovereign, that there is nothing outside of, of your ability uh, to deal with, that you're all powerful, but you're all wise, and you're also all loving, and all of those pieces uh, are part of your character, so we can trust you. Lord, we lift up uh, to you, Dennis, and, and his family uh, in a very special way, just the comfort that, that, that they need, uh, the wisdom that is needed in a lot of decisions going forward. Uh, we thank you that Mr. Speedy knew you, and uh, from his perspective, all is well. So, Lord, we, we just trust you for, for life. Uh, we think of Jeannie. We pray for her and for Joe and the family. Uh, Father, again, you have led through this process and uh, put her in touch with a very reputable surgeon. And uh, Father, we just pray that, that if you might be pleased that uh, the cancer is localized. Uh, for Jenny uh, and Alan and their daughter, Lord, we don't know how to pray about this. Um, so we put her into your hands. We pray for your leading. Uh, Father, we pray that, uh, the, that the transplant that's needed might be successful whatever that timetable might be. Lord, for Steve uh, and uh, just his journey that uh, he might come to know you, find out who you are, the grace that you can give. We sang all we sinners, that's all of us, that all of us come to the foot of the cross uh, on equal plane. And we need what Jesus did for us. Uh, and Father, there's no one who is outside of your ability to save except those who are too proud to admit they need a savior. Uh, we, we do pray also for this young man, a father, uh, 15 years of age, and just facing some, some real challenges. We pray, Lord, for the family. Uh, that's got to be really, really hard. We pray for wisdom to be able to find uh, some individuals who are able to help him uh, in this journey, and that, Father, you would uh, use this for something very positive in the work. Lord, we're grateful for the fact that we do know you through Christ, that we have trusted Jesus. And Lord, thank you for the hope that we find in Christ, that this life is not the end. Uh, it's really the beginning of something new that we get to walk with Jesus 
in our lives here and then for all eternity. So we find hope in you. We've sung the hymns and songs of hope, and we're grateful for that, that we aren't bound by what we see around us, but we can live with the reality of Christ in our heart and in our life and in direction. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen. Pastor Jim. Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's so good to be here. And we miss you guys. And it's only been a couple weeks, but we still miss you guys. Let me tell you a little bit about our journey so far. When the day came for us to pack up the house, everything went pretty smooth. And we spent that night, the, the last night in, the, in our house, it's our mattresses, and loaded up. And the next day, we, we went and got to, uh, well, I moved the moving truck over here so we could go to Frederick to do the design for the house and that. And when I moved the moving truck, Caleb heard a beeping noise, but didn't think much of it. And we, we, we were only going a few blocks, so, you know, we, we parked it here. We drove down to Frederick, and on the way to Frederick, our check engine light comes on, and the brake light comes on, and the battery light comes on. So we're like, oh, man, what should we do? And Tina was driving, so I'm Googling, like, repair shops and all that kind of stuff and trying to figure out, what, you know, where we can go. And we did make it to the place that we were signing to sell our house and, and that. And all that went through pretty well, except... They had a check for, to give us, and we're signing on our new house the next day, and they won't take a check because it's in our name and not the um, title company's name. So we told them that, and I said, you have to add that name onto the check, and they're like, well, we really don't want to do that. We'll just wire it to them. So all seemed great. So we're like, okay, that makes it easier for us. We don't have to do anything. So we get out of there, and we went to Mr. Tire, I think, or something like that, and that was kind of a cool thing because we get there and I walk in and I tell him what's going on. He goes, it sounds like you need an alternator. And I'm like, okay, can you do that? He goes, oh, yeah, we have nothing going on right now. We can do that. It'll take a couple hours. So I'm like, go for it because <laughs> I don't really have a choice. I'm just praying that they won't kill me on a price, you know. And, um, and they were really good. They were really good. But what was neat about that is people came in after us, just for tires, and they said, you're going to have to wait two or three hours so we can even look at your car. So if, I came, so if we would have got there half an hour, hour later, we might not have got in because it was already like two, three in the afternoon. So it's kind of like, and so we couldn't have dri driven back to Hagerstown because I was scared if I got back here and we needed something the store, I mean, the people couldn't get it on time be, you know, before they closed. So God worked out pretty good that way. They got us a new alternate on. It's working great. We have power. <laughs> we can drive. So we came back here to Hagerstown, and we got in the Penske truck, and we started out, and the horn's beeping. It's going beep, 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 beep. All right, so we checked all the doors. We did all that stuff, started it up again, went to drive it, beep. Beep, beep, beep. And you can't drive down the road, and it's not like it's a real horn. It's a regular horn that's beeping. So I called the 1-800 number, and they told me to call the local number. So I did that, and the guy goes, I have no idea what's going on. If you drive it here, I'll take a look at it. And this is their main mechanic. So we're like, okay, I'll drive it there. And it was all the way on, um, well, the last exit before you get out of Maryland. So it wasn't that far. But you're driving down the road, and beep, beep. Be, be, and everyone's like looking at you, and it's like, okay. So we get there, and I pull up, and the guy's looking at it. He's trying to figure it out. He goes, I have no idea what's wrong with you, this truck. And it's, the truck has 12,000 miles on it. And when I picked it up, they said, oh, you have no problem. It's a brand new truck. No problems at all. All right. So he goes, I'll tell you what. You can either get a different truck, or we can unload. You can unload everything. And it's like, well, I'm not doing that. Um, you know. <laughs> You guys can unload everything. Um, but anyways, so he goes, but I, or I can unplug the horn. I'm like, yeah, un, unplug the horn. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's two and a half hours. It's not like a long trip, you know. So they unplugged the horn, and we made it up there, and everything went pretty well. Well, the next day, we go to sign in our house, and we get it, and we go to the title place, and um, 
they're kind of like, all oh, right, well, we didn't get the money yet. They didn't wire you the money. Do you know who? And they had a hard time figuring out that whole situation. But they didn't seem as concerned as I was. I've been praying the whole time, oh, no, we're going to be homeless, you know. <laughs> but, they, but they're kind of like, well, we know you sold the house. We know, know how much we're getting. They just lost the wire somehow. So they just basically told us to go and unpack and that it would all be taken care of. And sure enough, it was. God's a good God. And even though it can seem really stressful on our end of things, he has everything in control. And everything did work out great. We're moved into our new home. We even have half of it already painted, which is nice. We'll be living in boxes for quite a while, you know. But that's okay. And things are moving forward, and things are exciting. And our God's not just a God that saves. He's a God that takes care of us until we're with him, even though it doesn't always seem like that. And today we're going to be in John 4. So if you have a Bible, let's open it up to John 4. But I just wanted to give you an update on where we were at. And we do miss you guys terribly, by the way. If anyone ever wants to come up and visit, come on up. We want you there, and we want to see you guys because we miss you already. Well, John 4, when you're turning there, let me tell you about a guy named James Smith. James Smith gra graduated from Waltrip High School in 1967. He went on to go to um, Sam Houston State University, the home of the Bearcats. He had a wildly successful career. He's, he married his wife, Sherry, over 37 years ago. He has two grown-up children. Their name is Jeremy and Tiffany. And he has seven grandkids. He calls them his grandbabies. And he actually is a bit of a social conservative. So if you talk to him about political things, he's going to fall on the conservative side. But right now, he's really unhappy with both sides. He's not happy with either side. But he's more satisfied with, the, um, with more of the conservative side than the liberal side. But he's unhappy with politics now in general. He actually cuts his own grass still, and he's really proud of that, and he loves his John Deere tractor, so Ray would love him. I mean, this guy, he always has green and yellow hats and the John Deere hats, and his garage has John Deere stuff in it and all that stuff, and he loves to talk about his John Deere tractor. James has a great sense of humor, but his crown and joy are those seven grandbabies he has. And what he does is he takes the oldest girl, and he's going to do it with each girl, and he's going to do something different with the boys. He doesn't know what yet when they get old enough where he can take them on a trip by themselves. But he takes his older grandchild every year to up in New York State, and they have high tea. Now, I'm not talking about the Keurig tea. I'm talking about the high tea where you stick your finger in the air and you, you, know, you, you sip it like that. And they just spend the whole weekend together. And he's planning to do that with all his grandchildren when he can. In fact, he's all in on his grandkids. If they're in any kind of sport or if they're singing anywhere or they're doing anything at all, he's there no matter what. He doesn't care how long it takes him, how long it takes. If it's raining, snowing, no matter what, James Smith is all in, and he's there to root on his grandkids. Nothing's going to keep him away from them. He has a dog named, a golden doodle named Oliver. And he's only three years old, and he just recently had him fixed to hopefully calm him down because he's a little bit of a hyperactive dog. And the truth is, this is how most of us know our friends and some family members. And we would call these people that we know like this friends, but here's a confession. I never met James Smith. This was a 10-minute search on Facebook that I got all this information from him. I don't know him at all. But he is a real person, and these are true facts about him. And like I said, the sad thing is, in America, this is how most of us know each other. We just know about each other. And we can even feel for each other and care for each other. But we really don't know each other's hearts and who they are. Social psychologists would say that I don't know James Smith at all. And actually, you can look him up on Facebook if you want. But, you know, James Smith is the most popular name on Facebook. So it might take you a while to find this one. But, um, but you will find him. But social psychologists would say that there's impersonal knowledge and personal knowledge. And I only know impersonal knowledge about James Smith. I don't know personal knowledge about him. 
and they are right. There's this difference between knowing and knowing about, isn't there? There is. And I think most of us, even in the church, know about each other. Because knowing about someone is very safe. We feel like we're friends and we're connected, but it's a safe area to be. But to truly know somebody's heart means that you have to reveal your heart to them too. And that's a very scary place to be. Because then we're opening ourselves up, up to some maybe some really, really hurt, hurt. Now, it's true. If I saw James Smith, if he walked in this room, I could say, hey, James, how are you doing today? How's Shirley doing? How's Oliver? Has he calmed down a bit? Man, with all this COVID stuff, did you get to go to do high tea with your granddaughter this year? I mean, I could get into a really good conversation with him. And if something happened to him, I probably would feel sad. And if I saw a prayer, a prayer request in that, I would truly pray for him. But I still don't really know him. And the sad thing is, I think even in the church, even with God, this is how most of us know God. This is how most of us know Jesus Christ. We talk about, oh, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? But the truth is, we only know about him. We don't truly know his heart. When we, even when we read the Bible, we read the Bible, the Bible in a way to, to, to get facts. Like, um, like when we're reading John 4, it's like, man, Jesus met the woman at the well. Jesus went out of the way to, to engage her. Jesus shared the gospel with her. And we know all these facts. But do we really know why he did that? Do we know his heart? Why he went to, to the well? Why did he go through Samaria? Why did he pick this woman? Or do we just know facts, impersonal knowledge about him? And then, in order to get personal knowledge, we have to open ourselves up to him also. So when we pray, do we just pray for things? Or do we pray for heart change? Do we tell Christ when we're praying, do we confess our sins, our greed, our jealousy, whatever it is, whatever those, I mean, <laughs> God, man, I just really messed up this week because I was just, I'm a really selfish person. Do we pray that way or do we just pray, God, help me get this business deal done? See, there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God, and it affects how you relate to him. So today, we're going, when we read John 4, and when we look at John 4, we're going to try to look at it in a personal way instead of an impersonal way. We're not going to come away with eight facts on how to witness to someone. We want to come away with, God, how can, how can I get closer to you because of this? And that will be the go of today. Because I think the more we're in church, and I know here we've been, a lot of us have been in church a while. I think the longer you're in church, the, the more we have this idea that we just get to know facts about Christ and we don't fall in love with him more. And when you first come to Jesus Christ, man, you're madly in love with him. I mean, man, I mean, you have a relationship with him. You know him. You're intimate with him. You tell him things. And for some reason, the longer that we're in church, we lose that. And, it's, and we have to get back to that. And that's not only true here. It was even true in the new church. I mean, the early church the, in Ephesus, when you read the book of Revelation, they say, man, when you read it, it's kind of like, uh, this is my paraphrase. It goes, you guys know your doctrine. You're really good at what you teach. But you forgot about your first love. You forgot about Jesus Christ. You don't love me like you once did. And I think that's true with all of us. So when we read John 4 in just a minute, we're going to read it to get that idea. So the, because we can only do that if we behold Jesus Christ. You can only have a relationship with him if you, when you read the Bible, if you look at it to know who he is. And this is true because listen to what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says this, And we all with unveiled faces beholding that means looking intently, looking to actually get to know, beholding, looking with awe, the glory of the Lord. We are in awe of the glory of Christ, are being transformed to the same image from one degree of glory to the other. 
for this all comes from the Lord, who is spirit. See, it's only when we look intently at Jesus Christ to know who he is, not what he does, does God change us from one degree to the next to be more like him. And I love that because it's not saying that it happens right away. It's one degree at a time as we gaze in awe to know his heart and who he is. So before we go any further, let's just stop and let's just pray. All right, so can you pray with me for a moment? Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you now. I just pray that your spirit will speak to my spirit and everyone's spirit in this room. Let us put all the things on hold for a while. Some of us this week had really, really busy weeks. Some of us had weeks that we wish we never had to relive again. And some of us had crazy, excellent weeks that we don't want to stop or go away. But all this stuff can get in the way from hearing from you. And we just pray now that we can put all that stuff in the back of our mind and that you will speak to us and to our hearts so we can know you and fall in love with you more. Because we know the more we love you, the more we'll want to obey you, the more we'll want to follow you, the more we'll want to imitate and be like you. Heavenly Father, this work in our hearts and our minds today so we can feel you and know you and understand who you are. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name I pray, amen. All right, John 4. I usually have you stand up, but we're going to read quite a few verses today, more than usual. So I'm going to have you stay sitting down right at the moment. But we're going to read John 4, starting at, at verse 1. And don't worry, we'll get through this. I know it's a lot of verses, but we'll make our way through. All right. It's a great story, and it's one of the most popular stories. And if you've been in church for any amount of time, you know this and love this one too. John 1, uh, John 4, verse 1 says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself didn't baptize, but only the disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now if you underline in your Bible, I have in my Bible that word had underlined like four times. That's an important word here. And it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's in the middle of the afternoon. But isn't that cruel that Jesus gets tired? If you're ever getting tired, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're getting tired of people, if you're getting tired of your circumstance, or this physically tired, Jesus got physically, he got tired too. He understands. All right, I think that's just kind of neat. We, have to, some, we sometimes forget the, the human side of Jesus. And it goes on, and he says, And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Now that's kind of weird. And number one, why would his disciples leave him with nothing, no way to get water? I mean, he's tired. You think they would say, Hey, let's get you a drink before we leave. They didn't even think about it. You know, they just left. And I think that's kind of funny. But it's also weird that it says, Why would she ask this question? Why would the woman ask, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at the next verse. It says, for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. That's kind of shocking. We'll look at that more later. But for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where, where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> She's going to find out. Yes, <laughs> he's far greater. He gave us a well to drink from, from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, 
Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water well enough to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come and draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people are to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. Now, this is really cool. The disciples don't even know this part. Check this out. It says, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with the woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Now we're going to skip to verse 39. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Wow. What a passage. This is an awesome narrative. It's an awesome story. We could spend a month or longer in this story, but we're not going to. In fact, we only have a few minutes to spend in this story. But the whole story revolves around two verses, and they are verse 26 and 42. It's 26 and 42. And, 20, and 26 is this. It says here, right after the woman says, I know the Messiah is coming, the one they call the Christ. And when he comes, he'll tell us everything. And that's when Jesus nails her with this. He says, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The disciples didn't even know that. Jesus is saying he is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one that all the Old Testament, this Bible at that time, was writing about that was going to come and deliver the people and save them from their sins. And Jesus said, I'm him. And then verse 42, look at the end of it. It says here, it says, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Because Jesus is a Messiah, he is indeed. It is true. No, it is a fact that he is the Savior of the world, the whole world. And everything that happens in this narrative revolves around those two passages, that Jesus Christ is a Messiah, that he is the Christ, the anointed one. And because of that, he is the Savior of the world. And there's a lot of little things in this story that we could point out. But the first one I want to point out today is the very first sentence that I had you underline, that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why did he have to go through Samaria? That wasn't something people did back then. See, there, it's true. To get from Judea to Galilee, you, Samaria was in, the, in between. And you would have to go straight through. And if you went through, straight through, you would go to Sychar. That's what this town where Jesus met this woman in. But the problem is the Jewish people, even the bad Jewish people that didn't practice, would never go through Samaria. And they would always go the long way around, which would take days, at least a day to two days to go around. Most people say a day and a half to two days from what I've read. They would take that trip no matter what. And 
why would they do that? Well, the Bible tells us. It says they despised them. They did not like the Samaritans. And there's a good reason. The Samaritans weren't very nice people to the Jewish people. The Samaritans that lived on the edge right close to the Jewish people would actually raid the towns of the Jewish people. They would break and steal their stuff and burn their crops and in some instances would even rape their women. So the Jews despised them. But the funny thing is, the Jews did the same thing to them. (laughs) So the Samaritans despised the Jews. They hated each other. Talk about racial tension. It's nothing like we see today. I mean, they despised them. They disliked them. They hated them. But Jesus had to go through. Why did Jesus have to go through? Because he had a divine appointment. With who did he have that divine appointment with? Oh, Samaritan. But not only a Samaritan, also a woman. Which, if you know anything about the Jewish culture back then, men didn't speak to women. So here, not only is she a Samaritan that they despise, she's also a woman that's lower on the totem pole in their culture than the men are. And Jesus, being the Savior of the world, had a divine appointment with a Samaritan woman in the well in the middle of the desert. Isn't that kind of cool? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you think, what your family background is and what your heritage is. Jesus has a divine appointment to meet with you every single day. And if you haven't met with him for the first time and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he wants to do that today. But for those of you that do know him, he wants to meet with you daily. And it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. It's like he had to meet this with this woman. He wasn't going to let culture and that get in the way of that. And the truth is, if we're his children, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he lives in you, and we have the same mission he has to to go out and to tell other people about him. Who who in your life is getting in the way? I mean, is it, who would you not want to go to today to share Christ with them? Is it any place that you would feel uncomfortable going to, or a group of people? Maybe it's a different political party. Would you go to one of their rallies? Would you go to a Black Lives Matter rally to speak to someone about Christ? Jesus didn't go there to say, hey, I know more than you. He went there because he loved this woman. Would you go to a group of people that's different than you, that you disagree with completely about almost everything because you love them enough to tell them about Jesus Christ? We should. We shouldn't let those things get in the way. We should, if Jesus Christ lives in us and he gave us a new heart, we should have the same attitude as he had, and we should want to go to the people who he went to, which was everybody, because he is the Christ. He is God who created the universe, coming down in the flesh to live for us and die for us, and now he indwells us. And we have to go to people who maybe our friends and family despises, and we might have to go to them out of love to tell them about Jesus Christ. Are we willing to do that? Maybe this morning we have to take time when I'm done just to pray about that and to confess to God, to be intimate with him and confess with him that I'm not there yet, Jesus. (laughs) Help me to love people the way you love this woman. So why, well, let's talk about this woman. Why is she there in the middle of the afternoon? Has anyone here been on a mission trip to a country where the women all had to get together and go get water from a well from one central location? I'm told that even to this day when women do that, they get together in a group, usually in the morning. And, then, and why do they get together in a group? Because they like to talk, right? <laughs> they do. And what do they talk about? Their husbands, you know? <laughs> Can you believe he left his sandals outside the door, in the, in, in the house, and he didn't put them outside the door after walking around in the streets all day? I can't believe that. I don't know what they talked about, but they talked about, they gossiped a little bit. They talked about, well, you know, I think so-and-so is going to get married to, I, I don't know, but they do what women do, right? They do that to this day. I mean, when, when a lady goes to the bathroom, usually they grow in a group, you know. But it was, for, it was, it was, it was to talk. 
But it wasn't only to talk, it was also for safety reasons. But it was a communal thing. It was a thing where they could get together because they didn't see, they don't have Facebook, they don't have, they couldn't text their friends. So this might have been the only time during the day that they would get together with other women too. So it was a time for them to, to connect to each other. And this lady isn't doing that. This lady's avoiding that experience. She doesn't want that experience. In fact, she's going way out of her way to not to be part of that. Why? What's the reason? Well, the Bible tells us, it says that she had five husbands, and the man she's now with is not a husband at all. And today we would just think that's a wild four years of college. But not back then. Back then it could be a life sentence. This was not acceptable in Samaria back then. Now, what happened to her husbands? I don't know. Usually people say she was really promiscuous and ran around a lot. I don't think that's the case because, man, I mean, that just wasn't what happened back then in Samaria. In Ephesus and other cities it might have been, but not here in Sychar. It could have been that each one of her husbands died. And there might be a legitimate reason why she had five husbands. You could die easily back then of different things. I mean, back then, you get sick. You could die. They don't have vaccines. They don't have penicillin. They don't have what we have for doctors today. You could get kicked by a, a horse or a mule. You know, I mean, there's a lot of ways. They had lions. They had bears. There's a lot of ways you could die. And it could be that each one of her husbands died. She might have been trying to do everything the right way. She might have been, like today, the good Christian girl doing everything the way she's supposed to. And her husband's dying, one after the next, after the next. And now after five of them are dead, this new guy's like, man, I'm not marrying you. You're the black widow. Um, I know what happens if I marry you. I'm dead. So instead, she just moves in with him. So not, and she just might have got to the point where she just gave up trying, trying to do everything the right way. She goes, what's the use? So now she's just living with the guy. And she doesn't care anymore. We don't know what her story is. And the Bible doesn't tell us, and I think that's a good reason, because we can kind of relate to her. I think all of us know what it's like trying to do everything the way God wants us and to follow the plan and to be the nice churchgoer who does everything the right way, and nothing ever seems to work out. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I mean, man, why do I keep getting sick? Why are my kids going the wrong way? We did everything right. We prayed for them. We did devotions every night. We brought them to church. Why are they rejecting God? Have you been there? I've been there. And sometimes it's really easy to want to give up like this woman might have did. She's finally like, I give up. Try to do it the right way. It doesn't work. I'm going to do it this way that everyone else is. But Jesus, being the savior of the world, doesn't let her off that easy. So he goes and he meets her, and he's like, hey, I got some living water for you. Give me a drink. And she says, man, you have nothing to drink of. You're right. I got water that if I give you, you never be thirsty for anything again. And look what she says in verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come and draw water. This woman's begging him for this living water that he just talked about. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you're right. He, it sounds cruel, doesn't it? You, you're right in saying, I have no husbands. You have had five husbands, and the man you're now with is not your husband at all. What you said is true. What's going on? Why is Jesus saying, go get your husband? I mean, if somebody comes up to me and says, how can I have eternal life? How can I have living water? I would have pulled out the Romans road and said, hey, right here, say this prayer after me and you're going to get saved. But why doesn't Jesus do that? Why didn't he jump to the point and say, I'm the Messiah. I'm here to save you. Why does he go this road? Is he being mean? Does he not love her? Well, we know he loves her. That's why he came. Because he so loved the world. Right? So it has to be something. And the truth is, he's not being mean. He's not being cruel. Jesus just doesn't want to save her for eternity. He wants to save her and heal her. He wants to heal this 
guilt that she feels, the shame that she feels that's keeping her away from everybody else. He wants to pull that out of her so she can not only be saved but be, be a new person. And that's what Jesus, I believe, is doing here. He's pulling this out of her, and he's going, and she's going, please give me something. And, she, and he's going, I will, but wait a minute. First, we got to deal with this insecurity, this guilt and this shame you have. Because I can heal that. I can take care of that. You don't have to live that way anymore. This lady came in the middle of the day to avoid people. She thought that her guilt was driving away from people, and she thought that she would be better off being by herself, but really it was enslaving her. And Jesus wants to free her, where she's not enslaved by anything anymore. And this, think about it. We do the same thing, don't we, sometimes? I mean, when... I mean, look, Jesus says, I mean, this woman says, you know, where can I get this living water? And Jesus says, do you want living water? Go get your husband. And she's begging him. And Jesus says, seems like he doesn't care. But he does care. And he cares deeper than she even knows. And she wants to save, and he wants to save her and free her so she can go back and do something amazing, which we're going to see in just a little bit. But this lady has some hurdles that she has to jump through before she can trust Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. So what does she do? When Jesus says, I have this, this water, she, and he says this about her husband, she is sort of saying, okay, she puts up a roadblock. And do you do that sometimes? Sometimes I do that. Sometimes when I'm getting personal with Jesus, man, it's so much easier to look at my phone, check my messages. And when we're in a life group or a small group or a Bible study of some time and it starts getting too personal, sometimes you change the subject to something else. It happens a lot. It happens a ton with you. When you start getting personal with the youth, they'll all of a sudden say, well, what about people that never heard of Jesus? You know, and that's what this lady does. She changes the topic. Look at it. She says, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. I see that you're a prophet, and you say that we're, you're supposed to worship on this mountain over here, and we say we're supposed to worship over here. See, we're this two different from each other, and she thinks she has him. She's saying that, man, we're not the same. And today, we might say, man, you know, you go to a different church. Your church has chairs. We have pews. We're more traditional. You guys are more, you know, I mean, more liberal because of the chairs. Oh, you know, we're not going to talk about this anymore. Or I use the ESV Bible. You guys use the New American Standard. Conversation over, right? Except Jesus, being the Savior of the world, knows this. And he's not going to let her change the subject. So he says, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here. Now she should be getting a hint that something's going on. He, he's, if he was a prophet, he'd be saying an hour is coming and soon will be here. But he says it, it is here now. The hour is here right at this moment when you are speaking to me. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. She, can't wor she can worship in truth, but she can't worship in spirit yet because she has this stuff in her that Jesus has to bring out of her. A lot of times when we come to church, we want to worship in truth only, and we just want the facts about Christ. But he, we, he wants us to worship from our spirit, from our heart also. And a lot of times our hearts aren't engaged when we're reading the Bible, even during the week, are they? We want to know something about God, but we don't want him to change and to pull out our insecurities and our deep secrets inside of us, even though he already knows them. Jesus knew everything about this woman, but she's still trying to hide, 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 hide it from him. She can't worship in spirit because she's not able to fully trust him, and, know, and she doesn't know who he is yet. And Jesus says, neither on this mountain 
nor on a dipping mountain, but true worshipers will worship me in spirit and truth. And that's going to happen for you today. And it can happen to us today. Every day we have to have that attitude. God, am I going to worship you? Am I going to read the Bible to know you in truth and in my spirit? Am I willing to give up my insecurities, my fears to you today? And that's what we have to get to. And this woman goes, she has one more, one more card to play. And she thinks she has Jesus that is going to stop the conversation code. And look at verse 25. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. I can just imagine Jesus smiling at her. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever played chess or not. But if you played chess, there's a move called checkmate. There's no other moves you can do after that. The game is over. And Jesus posed a checkmate on this lady. And he says, I'm him. <laughs> yep, you pulled your last thing saying, yep, when the Messiah comes, when the Christ comes, he'll tell us all things. I'm, I'm the Christ, he says to her. I am that person. And just then, what happens? The disciples show up. The disciples show up, and it's really weird because they don't say anything. The Bible says they just are in awe that he's talking to a woman. He, they don't even care that she's a Samaritan. They're like, oh, he's talking to a woman. And they don't ask him, what do you need? Can we help you with anything? Or they don't say, what's going on? They just stare at him. They don't know what's happening. It says here in verse 27, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. Can you imagine how awkward that must have been? <laughs> They're just like, and the woman's sitting there, and she's probably all puffy-eyed and has been crying because when you get intimate with Jesus and personal with Jesus, and he pulls that guilt and that shame out of you, and he changes you, and he makes you into a new person, you can't help but cry. So you know she's probably been crying. And they're like, dude, should we have came back later? What's going on, you know? And this woman doesn't care. Why does she go to the well? To get water, right? She leaves her water jar, the Bible says. She leaves it, and she goes into town. Why does she go into town? To tell people what happened. She, she goes into town. She goes, come, see the man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now, just wait a minute. What was her past like? How many husbands does she have? And she's living with somebody now? Along the way, I could just imagine what the devil must have been putting in, the, in her mind. Can you imagine that? Oh, you can't tell these people that. They're going to say, oh, not another guy. <laughs> Come on. It, well, how, how, how many is it going to be? Fifteen now? You know, I mean, but she doesn't care. Why doesn't she care? Because she met the Savior of the world that not only saved her, but also healed her. And she's a brand new creation. And, that, and she has that living water in her that's bubbling out of her. And she can't keep it to herself because if water is bubbling out of someone, it goes everywhere, right? If it's bubbling out and over your sink, it's going all over your kitchen floor. Well, this water is bubbling out of her. This, this new spirit she has is coming out of her, and she has to tell other people. She doesn't care what they think. She doesn't know what they're going to think. And if anyone's least qualified to tell the people of Sychar, it's her. She's the one that, no, this a few hours or an hour before this, was hiding from people, trying to be away from people, thinking people wouldn't accept her, didn't want her around, and now she's going to those same people to tell her about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? If we are truly intimate, have a personal relationship with Jesus, it's going to be in us, it's going to come out of us, and we're going to want to tell other people. I think the fear is when we get more of an impersonal relationship with them, we have this head knowledge of these facts. And facts never, who wants to share facts with people? And when you go and you say, hey, look, look at the nine ways that I know that Jesus is true, people are like, okay, yeah. But if they see it coming out of you and flowing out of you, they want what you have. And they'll listen to you. She didn't know hardly anything. Just come meet the man that told me every, everything I ever did. I think he's the Christ. And they all go out to him. It's amazing. They all fly out to him. And they go out, and the Bible says that they, that they listen to him. 
and that they begged him to stay two more days, and he stayed two more days with them, teaching them about who he was. And I think he was doing the same thing he did with her, pulling out the insecurities and the guilt and the shame so they could be new creations. And I couldn't imagine that little town after that. We're not told much about it after that. But I bet it changed the whole area. <laughs> it had to have. Because if they were all like this woman, it had to affect everybody around. He is indeed the savior of the world. And not only that, he's also the healer of the world and your world and my world. And he wants to come and not just save you for eternity, but he wants to heal you of your insecurities. So this living water, you won't want to keep to yourself, but you're going to want to pass it on to other people. So I hope here today that I just encourage you to get, have a personal relationship with Christ. One, that you reveal your insecurities that you have in your daily, when you're praying with him and when you're reading the Bible and when you're reading the stories, because the truth is we're all like this woman. All of us in this room, it doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. And there's things that we don't want other people to know. And there's things that we're ashamed of and we're scared of. And if we're scared of people knew about this about me, they wouldn't want to be around me. And we hide it from people. But we even hide it from Jesus. But he knows. He knows. And he wants to heal you of that this morning and this week. And this is a daily thing that we have to continue to do. So when you're reading the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, how does this relate to me? How I'm not the hero. See, a lot of times when we read the Bible and we read like the story of David and Goliath, we want to be David. But the truth is, there's other people in that story that are up on the hill, a whole army of Israelites that are trembling in fear, that can't step down and fight Goliath because they are ashamed and scared or feel unworthy to do it. We're not David. We're like the Israelite army up on the hill. And David, Jesus Christ is David. And he saves us from our Goliath. And then after what happens after the story of David and Goliath, all the Israelites come running down and they rout the Philistines. Man, we have to be like that. We have to get personal with God. And we have to say we're not the hero of the stories when we're reading the Bible. We're usually the bad guys. We're usually like this woman at the well. We're not the disciples even. We're the woman at the well. We're the Israelites up on the hill too scared to go down and fight Goliath when God promised us the victory. And we have to get personal with that daily and confess that daily to Christ. And when we do, we're going to see him in a new way. He's not going to shame us. Did he shame this woman? No, he gave this woman living water that overflowed. And she went into to town and she told people. And the whole town, it says, went out and got saved. It's amazing. He doesn't guilt us. He doesn't hold it against us. He frees us. But so many times, especially in America, we're so scared of what other people are going to think. This woman could have been so scared of what other people were going to think. If anyone should have been scared of what other people were going to think, it would have, should have been her. She had a terrible past. She didn't care anymore. And look how God used her. Could you imagine how he could use us? If we just get personal with Jesus, we just confess the guilt and the shame in our life, the stuff that we don't want anyone else to know about, and imagine what he's going to do with us. Imagine what he's going to do with you guys. It will be amazing, and it will be free, and he won't hold it against you, and we shouldn't hold it against each other. So can you just do one more thing for me this morning? Can you just stand to your feet when we get ready to close in prayer? And just close your eyes for a minute. It's just you and God here this morning. Maybe this morning you're saying, Jim, Pastor Jim, I don't even know Jesus Christ. I never even met him for the first time in my life. And maybe this morning you just, have, you just realize that you don't have a personal relationship with him that you never did. And you just have to confess with your heart that Jesus died and rose again. And just confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Just believe in your heart that he, that he is the Christ. And that means that he is the one that created the world. And he came down to us and lived the life we should have lived. 
and he died to death on a cross that we should have died. And he didn't stay there. He defeated death and rose again. So he, now he's at the right hand of God the Father. And if you trust in him this morning as Lord and Savior, he'll send the Holy Spirit that will live in you. And that spirit won't stay there. It'll, want to, it'll be like living water that overflows. And other people will want what you have. Or maybe this morning you're going, Pastor Jim, I know what this woman's going through. I'm saved, but I just have head knowledge of Christ. I've been living like that lately. I haven't been worshiping him when I come here in spirit and truth. I've been just wanting to know the word more. And this morning, I just have some guilt and shame in my life. As a believer, I've been, I haven't been living like I should have been. When I watch the news, I get angry at people that I see acting out. Instead of wanting to go to them and sharing the gospel with them, instead of loving them, I feel anger towards them. Just tell God this morning. He knows. Maybe there's something in your past that someone else did to you that you feel guilt and shame over. Tell Christ that this morning. There's nothing wrong you did, but it could have been something wrong that happened to you. Maybe you did do something wrong. <laughs> Maybe this week you looked at something on the, your phone that you shouldn't have looked at. Maybe you said something or felt something that you shouldn't have said to somebody. Maybe you could have helped someone when you didn't because you didn't think they deserved that your, your, your help, that they're there because of their own doing. Just tell that to Christ this morning. He wants to free you of that. He's your savior for eternity, but he's also your healer for today. He wants to heal you of that because you can't go and tell other people about them until you get that stuff taken care of. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are our Savior. I thank you so much that you had to go come and have a divine appointment with each one of us so we could get saved, so we could know you. But you just don't leave us there, that you also want to heal us. I thank you for healing me this morning. And I thank you for other people in this room that talk to you one-on-one -on -one this morning, that you will heal them also. Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit in us will be like this living water that you gave this woman, that would just not just stay to us, but it will want to spread it to other people, that we'll want to tell other people about you because you came and delivered and saved us. In Jesus' wonderful and mighty name, I pray, amen. Well, thank you this morning. You guys, man, when you, go out, when you read the Bible this week, I just encourage you to read it in a personal way to get one-on-one -on -one close with Jesus Christ. Thank you.